is a lecture on scalar functions and on the graphs of scalar functions and contours. In part two of this lecture, be another lecture uh, with the same title but called part two. In that lecture I'll show you how to calculate these for the kind of problems that show up in the homework. If the function returns one real number, then it's called a scalar function. Of course, if you have a complex valued function and it returns one complex valued number, then it's also called a scalar function. But here we're only talking about real valued functions, but the idea is that it returns one real number. This is a scalar function, f of x equals x squared plus 6 because it returns one real number, which you could call y. For contrast, here is a vector function. It doesn't return one real number, instead it returns a vector, so it's called a vector function. So we're dealing here with scalar functions, and they can be of more than one variable. This shows a scalar function of one variable. So in general, the function f is a scalar function if it maps r to the n into r1. This is the one real number um, that's the result of, of the action of the function. If you take r1 into r1, you have something that looks like this. A function mapping r2 into r1 might be f of x, y equals, let just say, sine squared x plus y cubed. All right. The result of this is one real number, which you could call z. You could even have a function of three variables. If it returns one real number, it is still called a scalar function. So you're looking at the range. There are two main examples for scalar functions. One are certain physical quali quantities, temperature and elevation in particular, and also pressure are physical quantities that are scalar. Temperature is just a value, elevation is just a value, and also, I didn't write in this list, but pressure is also a number. So a function that returns temperature, elevation, or pressure is a scalar function. And it can be defined on three space that's, or on two space. For example, the temperature on a plate or the elevation over a surface, that would map R2 into R1. The other set of scalar functions are various surfaces in 3D that can be written explicitly in terms of the coordinates. So I'll start off by just looking at the physical quantities to get some intuition and a feel on how, um, on how the graphing goes. So here are three classical examples, temperature, pressure, or elevation. If you're talking about a two-dimensional surface, such as the temperature on a flat plate, then you're mapping R2 into R1. But if you're talking about the temperature in some kind of a chamber or a room, then you'll be mapping R3 into R1, because a room would be specified by, each point in the room is specified by three coordinates, x, y, and z. And so you're mapping all those into one number, which is the temperature at that point. Elevation or depth are usually calculated from the surface of a three-dimensional object, so they are mapping R2 into R1, and R1 would be the value of the elevation at some point, x, y, and that x, y could be latitude and longitude, for example. There are two kinds of graphs that are associated with these scalar functions. One are just the values, a, a function, a graph showing the function values it's themselves, and the other are the contour plots. If you're mapping R2 into R1, then the function values are part of a three-dimensional graph. So here would be your x and y, and here is the value of your function, also call it z. And your function might have some kind of three-dimensional form here. I'm going to show you one like that in a minute. And that's the value of the function. The contour plots are two-dimensional. They're one dimension less. For example, if you had a function mapping r3 into r1, like the temperature in a room, then the graph would be four-dimensional plot because you'd have to have three dimensions to show, um, to locate the, uh, the points, and then you'd have to va have a value for the function. Of course, you can't draw a four-dimensional plot. What you use for the fourth dimension is color, for example. But when you did the contours, the contours would be three-dimensional plots. So here's an example. This gray shaded area the va are the values for the function. This would be a function of x and y. 
x and y down here. These are the, this is the domain, and here's the value of the function. It happens to be this kind of hat-like shape. Then projected down below are the contour lines. We did some of these before when we were looking at the um, uh, quadratic surfaces in like the first chapter in this class. And these are the traces. These are values for which z is a constant, or the function has a constant value k. And then they're projected down into this two-dimensional plane. This is a, because of the shape of this, they're all circular. So this is the value um, f of x equals 20 is circle, 25, 30, 35, 40, all the way up to the peak. So these are the contours down here. And this graph is a graph of the function. If the function has physical significance like temperature or pressure, then often you use ISO for the contours. Isotherms are contours of temperature, ISO meaning the same. This would be area, this would be a line showing all the points or a set of points where the temperature has the same value. In pressure, they're called isobars. So here's an, uh, an example of isobars. This is giving the pressure, it's a kind of a weather map. And you see how they're labeled. Everything along this line here, which I can't draw very well because it's all curved, has the same, all these points have the same pressure of 1028, and I'm not sure what the units are, maybe kilopascals. Okay, so these would be your isobars, and these are the contours. Now let's look at surfaces in three space. We had um, a whole list of quadratic surfaces in that first chapter, but only some of them are functions. Some of the, Only some of them are scalar functions. In fact, there's only two of them. One is the elliptic paraboloid, and the other is a hyperbolic paraboloid. The reason these uh, are scalar functions is because one variable, in this case the z, can be isolated. And so you can write f of xy equals z, and then I just rearranged it so it's c times x squared over a squared plus or minus y squared over b squared. So now you have a scalar function. It might be sort of confusing in, the, um, in this class that you see all these quadratic surfaces uh, in one in one chapter, then in another chapter you see them and they're doing something different, and then in another chapter you'll see them again, but the reason is that certain ones can be written in different ways. There are other surfaces in in three space that are also, that also can be written as scalar functions. Here are two more examples. You could sort of apply a vertical line test to these and see that they are functions. Both of these are cases, just um, Xeroxed them, or I scanned them in from the textbook. But now think of a sphere. The equation for the sphere is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals some constant, let's say 100. This would be a sphere of radius 10. You cannot isolate any one of these variables. You could isolate it if you were only considered the first part, like a hemisphere, like the top of it or the bottom of it. But if you're considering the whole sphere, then you cannot isolate any one of these variables. This shape, this sphere, cannot be written as a scalar function. In the next lecture, I'll show you how to compute those contours.